Greetings, beloved, and welcome to Mayo United Methodist Church, our worship for Sunday, November the 1st, 2020, and our celebration of All Saints Day. This is a special day in the life of the church and the life of our church each year that we set aside to remember all the saints, those that have come before us. In the United Methodist tradition, we do not remember saints as persons that did anything in particular or glorified way, glorified God in any particular way, but all persons that have known the salvation of our Lord are thought to be our saints. We do that with sort of a, a lowercase s. Um, we think of this as the cloud of witnesses, the glory of all believers. And so on this day, we take time to gather together in our worship to remember the God who has given us something to hope in, remembering the God that has given us a vision of that which has not yet been revealed, and also to remember those who have shared that with us, those who have loved us, and those we have loved as we lift up their names this day. So let us gather into this place of worship and gather our hearts and minds with our call to worship. We have come to affirm our historic faith, to worship the God of our mothers and fathers. We have come to remember God's benefits to us, the living, to respond in thanksgiving to the mighty works of God in our lives. We have come to affirm our trust in the God of all futures, to whose name be blessing and honor, glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Hear now our opening song of praise, We Shall Rise, by Harding University Choir. In the Let us join now in a time and prayer of confession. Let us prepare to take our place at the table of grace with servants among us and saints above us, united in the joy of Christ our hope. Let us pray. Everlasting God, whose timeless grace unites us, forgive the ways we have sinned against our ancestors. We fail to follow their example and heed their wisdom. Free us from the legacy of their sins. Forgive the ways we have sinned against our descendants. Our greed has threatened their well-being, and our hatred has damaged their peace. Free us to be your worthy servants in this hour. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The saying is true for all generations. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. This proves God lo God's love for us 
In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory be to God. Amen. Our scripture readings this morning both come from the New Testament. The first one is out of John's first letter, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Hear now these words. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation, the seventh chapter, verses 9 through 17. It is in the section of Revelation that is the breaking of the six seals, the seven seals, I apologize, the breaking of the seven seals. And this is what happens just before Christ opens the seventh and final seal. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God singing, amen. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these robed in white and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. This is the word of God, the people of God. Thanks be to God. As you enjoy our song of reflection this morning and and hear the notes come over you, I invite you to really think about the words, what we will be has not yet been revealed and how you think about and anticipate the revelation that is yet to come.
Beloved, will you pray with me? Wondrous and amazing God, we forget sometimes that we do not know all, that we cannot understand all, and that you are not yet done. Sometimes we judge you, ourselves, and others only for what there is now or for what has been. You remind us, you are the Lord of what was, what is, and of what is yet to come. This morning, we seek to turn our faces to that Lord, the Lord and Savior of what is yet to come. Grant us hope, grant us joy, grant us peace, and guide us in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm wondering, do you like to be surprised or do you prefer to know what is coming? Most people tend to like one a little more than the other. Some people are like me. I appreciate both, but only under certain circumstances. I don't mind a good surprise party. I think that's fun and joyous. Uh, I don't mind a surprise that has just a little bit of hint of what is to come. So for example, um, when filling out things about what a dream date might be for me, I, I've always said, you know what, I, I like a day where the person who's planning the date says to me, all right, here's what I, I want you to be ready to go at nine o'clock. You need to have on comfy clothes and good walking shoes and you should dress in layers and, and be ready to go. And then the whole day is an unfolding of surprises. That's the kind of surprise I like where I'm not stressed out over am I dressed appropriately or not, where the surprise doesn't scare me, where it doesn't seem to come out of nothing, but instead I feel like I've been at least a little bit prepared for the surprise. The more anxious I am about an unknown outcome, the less control I have over an unknown outcome, the less I like to be surprised. This is going to sound silly, but you guys should be used to me by now. And you should know that a couple of years ago, the Ravens did not have a great season um, and so I could not go into games with any level of confidence as to whether they were going to win or not. And because it was sort of a tough time for me, and, and I only had so much time built into my schedule, if it was going to be another disappointing loss, I really didn't want to watch the game for three hours. Now, because they play on Sundays, very often at one o'clock, and I am often still busy with matters of church on Sundays at one o'clock, I tend to record the games and then I watch them later in the day. This means the outcome is known before I sit down to watch the first kickoff. And I'm going to be honest with you, there were weeks where I would check the final score and based on that score, I would decide, did I want to watch the game or not. Now, this might seem very foolish to some of you, because if you already know they won, then what do you, well, I wanted to see how they won. And sometimes I was glad I knew that they were going to win, because in all honesty, you couldn't tell from the way they were playing in the first quarter. And if I had not known they were going to win, I would have been sure they were going to lose. And just the opposite, there were times where I knew they had lost. And based on the first quarter, I would have thought they were playing so well, and it was going to all be great and fun. And I knew that wasn't going to be the outcome. So sometimes we cheat just a little bit. Sometimes it helps us to know the outcome. I think God knows this about us, that most of us only like certain kinds of surprises. And some of us don't care for surprises at all. And when I use the word surprise, I do mean that in a positive way. There are also those things that seem to come out of nowhere. I hesitate to use the word surprise because sometimes they aren't joyful. The sudden accident, the sudden act of terror in the world, you know, the thing, the flat tire even, it just sort of changes the whole course of our day. These unknown, unexpected events um, that really do shape us are not usually my favorite experiences. They can be transformative, but it's also a, often a painful way of being transformed. As we gather together today for All Saints Day, I consider the words that God shared with us through John in both his letter and in the final revelation that is given to John by Jesus Christ. Each of them has a sense of wanting to live in the here and now and yet have just enough understanding of the final score, if you will, 
that whether we're in the first quarter, the third quarter, or the fourth quarter, wherever we are in the game, maybe it's just halftime for us, but wherever we are, we have a sense of how the game's going to play out. And all we're interested really in is how we're going to get there. What, what plays come together in the game? When are we going to score? When are we going to turn over the ball? But we know there's a win coming. That seems to be some of the idea that John is trying to lead us toward. But he reminds us as well of something that makes many of us uncomfortable. Those of us like the, that we like to be the people that know. Are you one of those people? I definitely am. I like to be one of the people that has the information, that when someone asks a question, I can answer it. I like that. I like to know things. And when I say I like to know them, I don't just mean in my head. I mean full body experience. So when we talk about a place, one of the reasons I love to travel is because I like to be able to say to people, I've been there. I've walked those lands. I've smelled those trees or flowers. I've seen what that water looks like. I've tasted the food in that area. I like to know something. I don't like to just experience it through other people. And so the more I read about other places, the more I want to go there because I like to know things. And John is trying to give us just enough to satisfy people like me, but also reminds us that in this life, we will never know all of it. He starts off by reminding us that it is what love the Father has given us. What a beautiful way to start off this conversation, to remind us that the whole thing is coming from a place of love, and to remind ourselves that sometimes people who love us know more than we do and choose not to share all of that they know, and that that is a loving thing that they do. They give us what we need to know, because sometimes more information is not better. And so we remind ourselves that God the Father does the same thing. He is trying to give us what we need to know, but not necessarily all there is to know. I would suggest that we would be so overwhelmed by all that God knows that we would be shut down and immobilized in that moment. And he reminds us that we are children of God, that God is our parent. Our life comes from God. And this is in the ideal of a parent, that, that perfect parent that is all loving and all caring and all compassionate and is doing everything possible to create a beautiful and wonderful life for their children. This is the parent that God is. For so us to remind ourselves that very often it is parents that know more than a child, but because all of that information would not necessarily be helpful, doesn't give a full explanation and instead invites the child to believe that they love them, that they are working for the best of their interest, and to trust in them. We are called in this earthly life many, many times to do the same with our Lord. You are my child. I love you. I care for you. I want the best for you, and I want you to be safe. And I have more knowledge than you do. Will you trust in me? Will you trust in me? And that is what we are, John writes. We should be called children of God, and that is what we are. We are children of God, seeking to trust in our holy parent. And then we are reminded, why doesn't the whole world act this way then? Well, because the whole world does not yet know Jesus Christ, and, and that has not yet come to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then I love this line, this, this, this second verse that he writes in this third chapter. He says, beloved, we are God's children now, right now. We're not waiting to be God's children. It isn't that someday we will be God's children, not that someday God will love us, but right now our holy parent is loving us and caring for us and seeking to raise us as his beloved children right now. But but what we will be has not yet been revealed. Isn't that, that's an exciting idea to me. That as great as it is to be the child of God now and to live into all that that can be, John reminds us that there is something yet to be revealed. There is more yet to come. There's a very famous story that went around a number of years ago uh, about a person who had passed away and they left a letter to their family, um, asking them to be buried with a fork uh, because she wrote that one of her most joyful anticipations was at the end of a meal when the host would say, keep your fork, because she knew that that meant 
a great dessert was coming. Not just a little bit of ice cream or a little bit of something, but something big. It was going to be pie or cake. It was something that you were going to need a utensil for. It might be thick and heavy and sweet. And it was going to be a, what she called a real dessert. And so she would get so excited when she was told to keep her fork. And so she wanted her family to display her at her viewing, holding a fork in her hand. So that as people came to view her body and they said, why does she have a fork? Her family could say with certainty, because she knew there was something more and better yet to come. That while she has had the meal, the dessert has not yet been served. And so she kept her fork. I remember that story being something that my mother and I shared between us. And not long ago, I was going through some boxes and some papers of my mother's. And I found an envelope with that story in it and a fork. A reminder from my mother, there is more yet to come, my daughter. And today we hear that message from our holy parent. Keep your forks. Keep your forks while I feed you now. I do not leave you hungry. I feed you with the gift of salvation. I feed you with the gift of love. But beloved, there is something so much better coming. And we see that in the Revelation passage today as well. And now when you read the book of Revelation, there's a lot of metaphor and a lot of imagery, and it can be incredibly challenging to try to understand all that is happening. And, and so I, I admit that my way of dealing with that is to try to find the most simple of promises and to not worry so much about all the details. I don't know exactly what all the seals represent or the lamps or the trumpet plagues and all the other things that are contained in the book of Revelation. And I don't pretend to understand it all. I, I leave it as a book of mystery, a reminder in my life that I am not meant to understand all that God has planned, but I am to trust in God. But I do understand some of the promises contained in our passage today, and I do understand this image. This image that part of what is yet to come is an existence in which all persons, a multitude no one could count, a multitude of people of souls together that no one could count, that are from every nation, every tribe, all peoples, all languages, all of the persons of God gathered together, that it will no longer matter how we look or the language we speak or how much money we have, all those things that we use on earth to decide what makes us better than others, that none of that will matter. We, we are to join a multitude and that all that this multitude is doing is worshiping God because they are no longer separated. And all the worries of the world, what John refers to here is the great ordeal. The great ordeal has already been surpassed, has already been overcome. Sometimes there are days where I think, yes, earthly life is the great ordeal. And I look forward, not in a way that wishes my life away, but in a way of hope that there will come a time where I don't have to solve problems. I don't have to do anything except be with God. Stand in front of Jesus, the shepherd on the throne, and say, you are amazing. Right? This song that they sing, amen. You right? Like, I hear that old spiritual right? Amen. 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 And now you know why I'm not a singer, but, but just that sense of, of our spirits wanting to just sing out, amen, that, that sense of, yes, God, that is really one of the translations, you know, yes, God, we are together, we are unified, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. That sounds like a cool existence to me, y'all, where all I want to do is hang out with my peoples, all of them, gathered together that we all like each other, we don't worry about any of the hurts and the wounds of this world, but instead of like, oh, amen, amen, oh, thanksgiving to God, oh, blessings, hey, amen to you, amen to you. And that's what we get to do forever. As I think about those that we lift up this day that have gone to that existence in the past year, as much as we may miss them, as much as we will always miss them, as much as we might wish on days that they were still here, I would not deny my grandparents or my parents or my aunts, or any of the other persons I've had to say goodbye to in my life. Beautiful existence that the scripture promises, that they are somewhere singing, amen, 
Amen. Blessings to you, God. Thanksgiving and honor and glory and power to you, God, forever and ever. And then that's what they get to do all the time. That sounds beautiful. And they're gathered together. And the passage we read this morning and ends with, it's, it's actually a couple of different passages out of Isaiah. Um, so it comes out of the 25th chapter of Isaiah and out of the 49th chapter, um, Isaiah 25, 8. And Isaiah 49, 10, if you want to go and look those up for yourself. Um, and then they're sort of paraphrased here. It kind of reweaves them together. But I just the reason I mention that to you is to know that these ideas are not new ideas. They have existed for thousands of years and have come to us through prophecy, through revelation and vision. And we hear them again at the end of the book of Revelation in the 21st chapter, verses 3 and 4, these ideas of what this existence is like and, and with the peace that we find in everlasting life and heaven in the life after, however you want to phrase that. Um, that there's this vision of that. And I just want to read them to you again. And, and I'm going to invite you especially for those of you that are lifting names up this morning, this day. And, uh, and perhaps your hearts are still hurting. Perhaps you have not healed fully from that loss. I, I understand that. Um, and for those that you're like, man, I'm not reading a name today, but there are names that echo my past. Beloved, I, I relate to that as well. It has been years since my parents died, and yet I think of them on this day. But I want you to close your eyes, if you will. And I want you to picture them existing in this way. They are before the throne of God. Worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne, he will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Yeah. What we will be has not yet been revealed to us. Keep your forks, friends. There is more yet to come. A time where our bodies, I mean, really when, when the Lord talks about no more hungering and no more thirsting, it isn't just those simple things. It's saying all of the things that bother your body, the pain that you know, the dysfunction that your body can bring to you, the, the limping and all of those things, none of that will ever be a problem again. You won't even be bothered by temperature. The sun won't burn your skin. The heat won't make you uncomfortable. There is no more frostbite. You never have to worry about your body again. You know, none of those things will exist at all. I want you to imagine how freeing that really will be. This time where all the things that, that are the great ordeals of this life just won't be a problem. And I find this comforting image that it is the lamb that will be the shepherd and the place he's going to guide us is to the water of life, the spring of the water of life, that we will drink from it forever. The reason we will no longer thirst is we will be at this spring, worshiping God day and night. And that there will be a moment where those tears that are on our cheeks from the things we have known, the great ordeals we have come through, that God will wipe them away. No more, my child. No more, my child. You shall not know pain. You shall not know thirst or hunger. You shall not know worry or fear. No more. You just get to be here and be loved and be with everybody else. You are my child now. But what you will be has not yet been revealed. Beloved, there is a revelation yet to come. And for whatever reason, it's something that we can't know now. But I do feel good that God had compassion enough to give us enough hints in the word that I feel like I know the final score, or at least I know the outcome. 
I, I don't know how we're going to get there. I don't know how many times I'm going to turn over the ball. I'm not even sure what quarter I'm in, in all honesty, friends. I, I'd say I'm in the third quarter, but that's just based on mathematics, and that may not turn out to be true. I may not even know how much time is left on the clock. But I believe there's a win coming our way. And the reason I believe that is because Jesus has already done that. Jesus has already won the game. We just get to play it for fun. We just get to see if we the best that we can be. How good of a teammate can we be? How much can we run up the score? How good can we be to our fans? All of these things. A simple metaphor, perhaps. But there will come a time where we will know all. And we'll get to experience all. And what this passage today promises us, what our beloved brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and grandparents and friends and neighbors, what they already know, is that it's an amazing thing to yet be revealed. This way of being fully in the presence of God. No more tears. Just laughter, singing, worship gathered together in a mighty crowd forever. Let us picture that as we prepare ourselves to honor the saints that we remember this day. Grace to you and peace from God, who is and was and is to come. Amen. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, 
the firstborn of the dead and ruler of kings on earth. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. We bless your holy name, O God, for all your servants who, having finished their course, now rest from their labors. Give us grace to follow the example of their steadfastness and faithfulness to your honor and glory. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Hear now the reading of the names of the saints. Gail Adams. Catherine Behrens. Stephen Bergman. David Cameron. Carolyn Chamberlain. Crystal Clements. Joyce Ann McCulley Combs. Lieutenant Colonel James Peter Erie. Richard Erlingson. Anne Gray. Maxine Lynch. Jeffrey Douglas McCulley. Leota M. Morris. Christine Noonan. Bill Rader. Charles Rader. Shields, Thelma Robinson Spence, Carol Thompson, Ishmael Torres. Mason Torres, all persons victims of COVID.
Now, beloved, let us share together in the prayer that our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, I send you forth to see what is yet to be revealed. May you anticipate it with joy. And when you are needing it, may you ask and call down from God, give me strength, give me wisdom. Help me to live through the great ordeal, God, because I am your child. I trust in you. Beloved, let us go forth from this time and this place to live as children of God until all that is to be revealed will be revealed. Let us be the children of the God who was, who is, and who is yet to come. Amen.